book of Psalm chapter 8. Amen. Psalm the 8th chapter. Now I'm going to be in Hebrews chapter 2 for those that really like to take notes. I'll start with Hebrews 2. Amen. Then we'll get down to Psalm chapter 8. So I got to go a little old school today. So you got to pay attention. Amen. Amen. Matter of fact, I will start off in Hebrews chapter 2, and then we'll move to Psalm. Uh, what I do love about the Word of God so often is when, an old te when the New Testament repeats the Old Testament. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew. The New Testament was written in Greek. There's 400 years between Malachi and Matthew. So when you open your Bible, even though it's one page for you, it's 400 years there. So it backs up for thousands of years. So sometimes you'll read something like the book of Isaiah 714. Many of you over the last two weeks, I've mentioned Isaiah 14, 714 to you, which says, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. You call him Emmanuel. Then you go over into the New Testament and the angels of God showed up. Remember last week, the angels showed up and said today there'll be a child born in Bethlehem and you'll find him what? Wrapped in swaddling clothes and we discussed that those shepherds knew where to go to find Jesus the baby because of that one sign swaddling because swaddling meant that the baby would be in the place called the tower of the flock which is where they would wrap little bitty lambs in swaddling clothes and lay them in a watch this a concrete manger they didn't put them in a wood manger they put them in a concrete manger so when Jesus was born he was in a concrete manger. When Jesus died, he was in a concrete tomb. It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, you can't make this stuff up. It just works, amen, all, all through Scripture. Then you get into Hebrews chapter 2, amen. I'll start with verse 6. It says, but one in a certain place testified. In other words, somewhere it's written in the Bible. I love when the Bible says somewhere it's written in the Bible. It makes me feel good when I'm preaching. I can't remember exactly where it is. But the writer of the book of Hebrews says, somewhere it is testified, somewhere it is written, well, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visited him? Let me say it again. What is man? What are you and I that God would leave his heaven, amen, wrap himself in flesh and come and visit us on this earth? But this is what Christmas is. The message this, this morning is simply called the incarnation. Amen. When, when flesh is wrapped around divinity, hallelujah, thou makest him a little lower than the angels, you crowned him with glory and honor, and you did set him over the works of your hands. That's right out of the book of Genesis, where God gave us dominion. Amen. Then he walks on to say in verse 8, thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not under him, but now we see not yet, but all things put under him. In other words, it hadn't happened all yet, but it's going to happen one day when everything will be subject to him. Verse 9 says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned in glory and honor, that he may be by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. So when Jesus came to earth, he came here for a purpose. One of them is to taste death for us. Amen. That we wouldn't have to go through that. For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, to bring in many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Let me just work on this one thought here real quick. The scripture says here in the book of Hebrews, in bringing many sons unto his glory. I remember when I first got born again, one of the things I, I questioned was, God, why did you do what you did? And the book of Isaiah said, so that he would have many sons. Now, when I say sons, I know we're in this gender-friendly day. But it literally means men or women. Amen. That he would have sons and daughters. That one reason Jesus died is so that God would not just have one son, but he would have many sons and daughters. Everybody follow that? And the book of Hebrews follows that up. Then Psalm 8, David said, and this is so beautifully stated. He said, when I consider my heavens. So here, we go back to Hebrews. When the book of Hebrews said, somewhere it said this. Well, this is where that somewhere is. In the book of Psalm, chapter 8, verse 3, When I consider thy heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that you visited him? 
For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor. You made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. Amen. That thou hast put all things under his feet. All sheep, oxen, yea, even the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes the pass of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. When you read Psalm 8, verse 3 down, it, it, it's almost like a, a crescendo. It's just something, it's something beautiful about it. Amen. And it tells us that God created us for a reason and that he visited us for a reason. Right. And then he said he crowned us and he gave us dominion over. How many realize how short we have fallen as humans? Amen. I mean, we have missed what God wanted for us. Father, I thank you for your word. Quickly anoint my, my voice to speak, our ears to hear. Grass hold this incarnation, this understanding of what Christmas is all about. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Psalm 8 verse 4 actually says, in another translation, What is man that you're mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? Why would God care for you and me? This has to be the question of Christmas and why Jesus came. As if to say, why bother with people like us? We ruined the Garden of Eden. You gave us another chance. And we fouled it up so badly you sent a flood to wipe out the human race except for one family. Why not just hit the delete button, God? Why not delete everybody? Just start all over again. Why not just admit that this was an experiment that didn't work out well? Amen. No one would blame God if he decided to get rid of all of us and start over again. Amen? Nobody would be upset about that. So David's question comes to the very heart of this Christmas season. What is man that God should pay attention to us? What is, I mean, when I pray, he hears me. Amen? When I hurt, he knows it. What is it about you, God, that you pay attention to people like me and about the people that I'm standing before? What is man that God should pay attention? What is man that God should care about us when we fail so miserably? Why should God care about us at all? The New King James Version renders that first in verse 4. What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you visit him? Why would God care enough to visit people like us? Why would he come to Bethlehem? Why would he wrap himself up in flesh? It is right at this point that we see the glory and the wonder and the mystery of the gospel. When the writer of Hebrews was trying to impress on the readers the greatness of our salvation. Amen. He actually quoted from these verses out of chapter 8 of the book of Psalms. So here's what we know. First, Jesus had to become like us in his nature. That's called the incarnation. We hear the word a lot. The word incarnation, if you take taking notes, is the union of divinity with humanity. When they come together, divine, deity, and humanity. That's Bethlehem. That's Christmas. He came into the world as a tiny little baby, little bitty baby Jesus. Born in a stable, in an obscure village, born in poverty, unwanted by the world. He was just another face in the crowd, and no one seemed to care that he had arrived. No, and listen, Jesus had to do this in order to truly visit us. He had to become like us. One of the songs we sang this morning mentioned the fact out of the book of John chapter 1 that the Word became flesh. Amen. So we go back and look at the incarnation. Here it is. So the Word became uh, human. And made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father, the one and the only Son. John testified about him, and he shouted to the crowds, This is the one I was talking about when I said, Someone is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. Now, when John said this, he's John the Baptist. He's the cousin of Jesus. He's about six months older, right? Amen, because Elizabeth and Mary were pregnant at the same time. Both had miracle babies. Hallelujah. But John knew coming up, he watched his cousin. Have you ever just watched somebody and realized there's more to that person than what meets the eye? Amen. He observed Jesus and he knew who he was. And he began to testify as he would preach because he gathered a crowd long before Jesus did. He was John the Baptist. He'd been baptized and he'd been putting people into the kingdom. He'd been rebuking uh, wickedness in the area. And so he made the statement that, hey guys, let me tell you, he's far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. What do you mean he existed before you? He couldn't have had. John, you're six months older than him. No, I saw something in him y'all didn't see. In the beginning was the word and the word was God, and the word was with God. Amen. That's what I saw. From the abundance we have all received one gracious blessing after another. Verse 17. For the law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Christ Jesus. No one's ever seen God but me, but the one and only Son is himself God and is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God unto us. So in John's gospel, it's like the last 
five verses here, amen, are, are like this finale, this musical composition played by some great symphony. Amen. We hear the rolling of the drums, the crashing of the cymbals, the entire percussion section, the orchestra comes alive, the fingers of the harpists fly across the strings of the trumpets blast. Hey, he's the son of God and he's always been. In the beginning was the word, the word was God, and God wrapped him up in flesh and he sent him down to earth as baby Jesus. Amen. Now that is known as being condescending. You hear the word before, condescending. I never like condescending people. People that talk now, I don't like condescending preachers. I don't like condescending. If you're good at what you do in life, don't, don't, don't bully it over somebody. Because they can learn just like you did. Amen? They can figure this out. So you have to be careful with that. But what Jesus did, there's another sign to being condescending. The word became flesh, took up residence with us. Came down from heaven, wrapped himself up. To condescend means to lower oneself to a level not normally occupied. Physically, mentally, or socially. It means to descend voluntarily to the level of another person. There are times when I'm speaking to little children, I condescend. Not to belittle them, but to get down on their level. I have actually seen parents stay in a condescending mode too long. Look, when you look at your 10-year-old child and you go, how you doing, baby? You've stayed in a condescending mode too long. When the child gets 30 and you go, how you doing, baby? You stayed in a condescending mode too long. Come on, give the preacher an amen. Amen. Eventually, you got to talk to him just straight up. Hallelujah. But Jesus did this, and with human beings, this is not always done with kindness. Sometimes there's an air of contempt, snobbery, haughtiness, amen, and human condescension. But there's that other side to it. It also means to graciously willing to do something regarding beneath one's dignity. When Jesus washed the feet of the disciples, he condescended. Amen. He went down on their level, and he began to serve them. Amen. He began to do something for them. And when the king of glory comes from heaven, leaves the throne, wraps himself in flesh, Amen. And dwells among us. He graciously did something that would save, save us and rescue us. This was God's plan. And this is what God did when he became flesh. It's a mystery. It is a mystery. He performed the greatest act of condescension, amen, of all time and eternity. The word that John personified is the very expression and manifestation of God. The creative power of God was in the word. Amen. That's why you got to speak the word. Everybody say the word. You, you hear this at times, but sometimes we forget it. Learn to quote the word. Learn to say the word, the very words of Christ. Amen. And get them inside of you. And they bring healing into you. They bring peace into you. They bring prosperity into you. Well, when I heard of the storms that blew across America, it was the gospel that I heard people speaking. It wasn't curse words. Amen. It was the gospel. Amen. That was rescuing people. So, again, it's very important. Uh, the scripture tells us in Mark chapter 14, verse 36, that when when Jesus committed no sin while on the earth, he experienced sin in a way that was far more overwhelming than committing sin. When you commit sin, you know, you kind of understand that there's a penalty to it. Here is someone who never committed sin, and yet the sins of you and I were put upon him. Amen. So much so that in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, Father, uh, all things are possible, but please take this cup away from me. Amen. I'm struggling with this cup. The, this, this fullness of this drink, amen, that I've got. John said that Jesus lived for a while among us. Literally, that means he pitched his tent. He cast his lot. He hung out with us, amen. Second, Jesus tasted death because that is a common destiny. Jesus came here to taste death. Death is uh, all around us. That's all we hear lately over the news about uh, the virus, things of that nature. We have forgotten that people have been dying and will continue to die every year. There's 260 to 300,000 people die every year in America from pneumonia and flu. You follow that? 260 to 300,000. You double that, that's 600,000. And yet all you've heard lately is that COVID took out 800,000. But you've got the 600,000, it's always going to be there. You follow where I'm going? So that's 200,000 over because of the pandemic. And yet all we have is our focus on this one moment. When Jesus came, he tasted death because that's our common destiny. Life is so short. Oh, man. Again, I tell you, I, it's like I'm brushing my teeth every night, and I go, where did my day go? Where did it go? And I rehearse my day to remind myself what I did that day. 
Amen. What the things that went on? Because they just tick by. And it's, you, you think when you're young, it's never gonna, you're never going to get old. But as you get a certain age, it's like tick, 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 tick. Amen. It moves by. How many know what I'm saying? Amen. And, and Jesus, they so short, and it's appointed unto man once to die. Jesus could not have truly visited us if he had not himself held back from the last enemy that confronts us. And that's death. That's the thing most of us are afraid of. So in order to be fully human, he had to taste death. Jesus suffered, amen, and died because that was the only way he could save us. Even as a baby, you remember, it was Simeon that said, this child will cause a fall and a rise and among many, speaking of his death that he came to die. He came to die for us. Now, next one, Jesus came to restore all that we had lost. The Scripture calls Jesus the last Adam. He, be, he, came, uh, 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 he came to reverse the curse that was brought upon our lives. Now, in heaven, he's crowned with glory and honor. And one day, all those who believe in Jesus will share that glory with him. Hebrews 2.8 says, at present, we do not see everything subject to him. At present, we don't see everything uh, underneath his feet. Amen. But it's going to happen. Better days are coming. Amen. I got to believe that. Today, we still weep. We weep for little children. Amen. Who die too soon. We wonder about all the suffering and pain and heartache and sickness and death that we see all around us. And whatever else is or is not true, this one thing is true. Man is not what he was meant to be. I wondered and I thought to myself on my way here this morning, what would this day be like had Jesus not came to earth? We'd still be practicing religion. We'd still be uh, slaughtering lambs. We would still be in a, you, we would probably be dressed different. We would be acting different. But when grace came into your life, it changed everything. Amen. When you know that a Savior came 2,000 years ago and was born in a stable in a concrete manger, amen, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lived 33 years, amen, lived a sinless life, died and resurrected, it changed all our lives forever. I look back on that, and I think of grace. I think of mercy. I think I, don't, I no longer live under the law. If you lived under the law, many of us would already been stoned to death. Amen. We would all been in a place in life where, where the women in here could not enjoy education. You couldn't enjoy working a job or, or even being a, a, actually a good mother. The men would be staunch, and they'd be uh, stiff, and, and it's so much so like what we see in the Old Testament. And yet, when Jesus came, he changed it all. I give God thanks for Christmas. Amen? Amen. I thank God for that. I thank God that he did not leave you and I alone. Albert, he doesn't stop messing with us. He's always interfering in our life. He's always nosy. He's the nosiest God I know. He doesn't leave me alone. He doesn't back away. He will not let us destroy ourselves or each other or the world that he's made. He loves us too much to let us alone. So he sent prophets, and guess what? We killed them. He wrote letters. We ignored them. He told us how to live, and we said, who are you to tell us what to do? We mocked the God who made us. Amen. We broke his laws. We said we didn't need him. He made up our own, we made up our own gods. Amen. We decided that if we were created a certain way, we could think our way another way. Mm-hmm. Amen. And we begin to do this to him. Oh, we made a mess of things, and we're still making a mess of things. Amen. God had every reason to kill us all, but he didn't. He said, I love you too much. I love you too much, and I'm not going to let you go. And after we had thrashed everything, God said, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to come down there and wrap myself in flesh. It will be the incarnation, and I will visit you. And he did. He came to the world in a very strange way. He entered through a virgin's womb. Nobody saw it coming. Amen. He came out as a baby born in Bethlehem, named Jesus to save us from our sins. Amen. He came because we blew it so badly. He came, we killed him. Amen. He died and became our Savior. No one but God could have done something like that. What a story. What a Christ. Amen. C.S. Lewis said, the Son of God became a man to enable men to become the sons of God. God has done it all. That's the good news of Christmas. Everybody say good news. Amen. He's done it all. The only thing left for you and me to believe is that God wrapped up his son in swaddling clothes and said to the world, this is my gift to you. Amen. I've thought about gifts. As, you know, we do. We give gifts for gifts. Somebody give you a gift, you give them a gift. How much that gift cost? I'll give you back the gift for that. I hate that. Amen. I don't like that at all. I, I, I want to give gifts without gifts coming back. I want to be able to be a blessing with it without, because I've already been blessed. We've blessed all year long. But the greatest gift that was ever wrapped was in those swaddling clothes. Amen. And this Christmas, I, I, I just asked God, Lord, help me to just be a gift to people around me. 
amen, to make those memories. I, I know it's about our children and, and our kids and letting them have fun because the whole issue of gifts, you know where they came from. The wise men gave gifts. Therefore, we give gifts. That's where it all started. Amen. They gave a gift of frankincense of worship. When you come into this house and you worship, you gave a gift. I love you, Jesus. Amen. You expressed yourself. They gave a gift of gold. He's divinity. He's God. He's incarnate. This little baby. Amen. His flesh wrapped around divinity. And he came to die. That's the incarnation. To die for our sins. Amen. A sinless man. Myrrh spoke of his death. That they would wrap him and bomb him. Amen. After his death. So these three gifts were given. Not usually what you would give to a child. So I close with these words. And let me just say, important if true. I cannot prove to you that all the things that I've said is true. I, I preach by faith. I live by faith. Amen. I've not been to heaven. I've not died. I'm not one of those who died and came back and told you what was over there. I can just tell you that this book teaches me, and I stand on what I believe. You, you can't go back in the thousands of years and see the prophecies of Jesus and see them fulfilled in the New Testament and say to yourself, well, that's just a coincidence. It's not. God planned it that way. He set it up that way. Amen. You'll have to decide for yourself. But I can say without reservation that I have staked my life on the truth I've preached. Amen. On the incarnation. Christmas matters because truth matters. It's not about a Grinch. It's not about a red-suited man giving out gifts. All those are little parts and little sprinkles of Christmas. Christmas is about the incarnation about God who wrapped himself in flesh and came to die for us. It's so much more than what we've made it. Amen. Christmas is about who we are and who God is and how far God will go for us. So at Christmas, we learn how much God loves us. And there's nothing more important than that. The message says, out of the book of Psalm chapter 8, verse 1, listen to this. God, brilliant God, yours is a household name. Nursing infants gurgle courses about you. Do you ever understood why that baby is goo gooing and gaga? The scripture says they're giving God worship. Toddlers shout the songs that drown out enemy talk and silence atheist babble. Whew. I look up at your macro skies, dark and enormous. Your handmade sky jewelry, moon and stars mounted in this setting. When I look at my micro self and wonder, why do you bother with us? This is David talking. Of course, the message is expanding in here. But when you say macro, you see the largeness of the galaxy. When you say micro, you realize how small you are compared to all the bigness of God. Amen. Why take a second and look our way? When you ask yourself, God, why, why do you care about me so much? This is what Christmas is about. Yet, we so narrowly missed being God's bright with dawns, with Eden's dawn, light. You put us in charge of your handcrafted world, repeated to us your Genesis charge. What was the Genesis charge? Take dominion over the earth. Take charge over everything there. You made us lords of sheep and cattle, even animals out in the wild. Birds flying and fish swimming, whales singing in the ocean deeps. God, brilliant Lord, your name echoes around the world. Whew. Hallelujah. This incarnation is what Christmas is about. Jesus coming to earth and wrapping himself. And again, we, you know, we're so caught up with space travel, aren't we? You know, we got, we got this one group out of Amazon flying up to space. You got another group running some kind of uh, uh, virginity airline flying up there in the space. And everybody wanting to fly. Long, long, long before any of that happened. 
the angels, space travel. Jesus, space travel. When he died, space travel. Guess what? When we die, space travel. Hallelujah. In a brand new suit. Glory to God. Amen. Father, I thank you for the word of God. I thank you for condescending and coming down here in such a way to show us how to serve, how to love, how to live. I ask God your blessing upon your people over this holiday. Lord, that we not forget what this thing is all about. I embrace you today. I thank you for your love. I thank you for the gift of peace. I thank you, God, for the good things that come from you. You've always been faithful. You've always been so, so good. And your love has been running after us. Bless this house in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Keep your heads bowed just for a moment. Would you just keep your heads bowed? When Jesus came to earth, the scripture teaches us that not only did he bring salvation, he brought healing. There's even a scripture says that healing's in his wings. Psalm 103, Psalm 107 talks about sending his word and healing us. There's one thing the body of Christ needs is a mental, physical, and spiritual healing. Oftentimes, it's our sickness that drives us closer to God than we've ever been. Had it not been for the crisis that we've gone through in life, we would have never came back to him. Had it not been for the wreck, had it not been for the disease, had it not been for the injury, we would have went on through life without recognizing what Jesus wanted to do in our lives. If something happened to you this year that brought you back close to him, would you put your hand up? Something happened to you this year that put you on, that drove you closer to him. Amen. Something happened to you this year that drove you closer to him. I'm going to hold your hands up if that's you. Now, I want us to say this together. Thank you, Jesus, for what happened to me that drove me to you. I give you praise that it wasn't the end. It was the beginning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now give God praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If I get our servant leaders to come up, amen, very quickly. I want to thank our booth back there for wrestling with the overhead and all the things they got to do to make things work around here. Amen. The offering envelopes are in front of you. Amen. So grab an offering envelope. I saw some of you while I was preaching making out your offering. I don't know if that was good or bad on my part. Amen. We appreciate your faithfulness in what you do. Amen. As uh, we begin to give today, and, and we, David will have some announcements for you, I want to mention to you that uh, three months ago, my wife, Sister Lori, had a biopsy done, and uh, this is not something we've, I told her we'd vocalize this today. We waited till now. But it's not something we've been trying to keep secret or anything, just something that in our lives we just kind of kept private. But she was, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, diagnosed with cancer. And uh, so we've been battling. So when she told me that, when we found out about it, uh, I used just a couple of words, we'll fight. And like many of you who have fought through cancer and diseases and you know, issues in your life, you fought. Amen. And while you have opportunity to fight, you fight. Of course, my wife is young. So uh, for three months now, we have been going through radiation and chemo. It <coughs> And uh, it'll change your life. It uh, connects you with people. Because I've been connected with people that have gone through this for a long time. But when it hits close to home, it changes you. So I've been a caretaker and a pastor and whatever, whatever else I could be. I just want to thank you and let you know that all I want for Christmas is her health. Amen? So we'll leave you with that. As we give today, we're believing God for... Jobs and better jobs, more money, less hours, benefits, sales and commissions, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, 
bills paid off, settlement, inheritance, rebates in return, debts demolished, royalties received, favor, success to the kingdom. All right. So December 19th, Lift Bible Study meets every third Sunday. Stay at They'll be right fellowship hall right after. Right? See them. You guys want your lady?